Hello, and welcome to another episode of Crimes and Witch Demeanors. I'm your host, Joshua Spellman. Last week, we covered the burning of a Capitol building, which just so happened to air on the same day that our Capitol was attacked. Am I a prophet? Maybe. But today, we're headed down to the wetlands of East Florida, just outside of Jacksonville, and investigating the spirits that haunt Kingsley Plantation. The princess turned slave, turned slave owner, Anna Kingsley, the vengeful and malevolent entity known as Old Red Eyes and the ghostly white peacocks that scream in the night are just some of the known apparitions. However, are these truly the ghosts that haunt the plantation? Or is the true haunting, the racial tropes and stereotypes that persist within these ghostly stories, paired with the bloody handprint of slavery on our history? Join me today to find out. I wanted to cover this story because I was getting a little tired of the same old stories of rich white folk as ghost tales often tend to be, and the story of Kingsley Plantation unfortunately is still often told as one. So instead of me focusing too much on the owner of the plantation, Zephaniah Kingsley, a rich white polygamous slave owner who was interesting in his own right, I wanted to focus in on the story of one of his wives, Anna Kingsley, or Anta Madagune Nadaye. Her history is that of tragedy and triumph, overcoming being sold into slavery, and even once she was freed, overcoming societal norms and oppressive laws of Jim Crow. For the history portion of this episode, let us delve into the life of Anna Kingsley so that we can better understand her afterlife and the other phantoms that lurk on the grounds of Kingsley Plantation. On June 18, 1793, Princess Anta Madagune Nadaye of the Wolof people was born in modern-day Senegal. At this point in time, this portion of West Africa was home to conflict between that of the Wolof and the Fula people, and villages in the area were often laid waste to by slave raids. The crisis only intensified, and in 1806, Anta was captured by raiders from the Futa Toro. She was taken by force to Gore Island, a slave debarkation point. She was kept prisoner for days with little to no food. However, on the first occasion that she was presented to European buyers, she was sold. Unfortunately, this catapulted Anta from one horrific situation to another. The journey across the Middle Passage was long and arduous. The enslaved were shackled to wooden boards, confined to tight quarters, and were malnourished and overheated. Those who had died from heat stroke or starvation were simply thrown overboard like rotted meat. Some of the captured managed to escape and threw themselves overboard, as death by drowning was preferable to the horrid conditions on the ship and whatever fate awaited them once they arrived at their destination. The ship landed in Havana, Cuba, and the passengers were immediately forced into isolation. This was done to help prevent the spread of any diseases that may have been brought over and to make them presentable to potential buyers. In the autumn of 1806, it was finally time for Anta to be put up for sale. It turns out that luck was on her side. That day, 43-year-old Zephaniah Kingsley, an English merchant, had been in Cuba to purchase rum, molasses, and of course, as was the fashion of the day, slaves. It was at this auction that he had laid eyes on then 13-year-old Anta and decided that he had to have her. He desperately outbid every other slave trader and merchant there, eventually winning ownership of Anta, soon changing her name to Anna. Now, there is nothing about slavery that is good, but the fates were looking out for young Anta, rescuing her from a destiny that could have been much more dire. While still a slave trader and a slave owner, Zephaniah held views on slavery that were atypical for the time and would benefit Anta until her death. And, although not ideal and though it raises many modern day concerns, Anta was wed to Zephaniah in a traditional African ceremony while still in Havana. This ceremony was certainly not a Catholic one, and therefore was not legally recognized by Spanish Florida or the United States at any point during their lifetimes. After this unconventional marriage, the couple made their voyage to Zephaniah's plantation, Laurel Grove, located in present-day Orange Park. However, Zephaniah and Anta did not arrive alone, as by the time their ship landed, Anta was with child. 
Despite still being a slave, instead of relegating Anta to the paltry slave quarters, Zephaniah invited her to stay with him in his home. This was a welcome change from the gruesome living conditions Anta had been subject to for the last several months. Laurel Grove Plantation was home to over 100 slaves that worked to produce cotton, oranges, peas, and potatoes. As mentioned earlier, despite being a plantation owner, Zephaniah's views on slavery were unique. However, make no mistake, he was still a slave master, but he was more humane than most. Zephaniah employed a system where the slaves were appointed certain tasks for the day. They were allowed to work as quickly or as slowly as they pleased, and when their day's work was complete, they were allowed to use their time as they wished. Zephaniah allotted slaves their own fields to grow their own crops, and some slaves spent their free time creating crafts, which Zephaniah permitted them to sell along with their own produce. Instead of segregating his slaves by sex or some other method, Zephaniah preferred that they live together as families rather than being split up. However, despite this uniquely humane treatment of his slaves, his motivations weren't truly altruistic. He believed that if you treated slaves well, they would be more productive and less likely to rebel. Regardless, Zephaniah also often granted his slaves freedom. Visitors to the plantation assumed that Anna was a free woman. After all, she ran the plantation alongside a manager, a freed slave, while Zephaniah was off on business. By 1811, when Anna was 18, she had borne three children. George, in June of 1807, Martha, in July of 1809, and Mary in February of 1811. It was also this year that Zephaniah granted Anna full and legal emancipation, reinforcing her important position and place of power at the plantation. In 1813, Anna petitioned the Spanish government, which still ruled Florida, for land. She was granted five acres in Mandarin just across the river from Laurel Grove Plantation. Anna purchased equipment and goods to start her farm, including 12 slaves of her own. Now, it may seem unusual for a freed slave to go and purchase her own. However, the concept of slavery was a part of her culture in Africa. That included the model of female slaves often marrying their masters to gain freedom. Regardless of her views on slavery at the time, Anna was dead set on becoming an independent businesswoman, selling goods, produce, and poultry for her own profit. Sadly, this particular business venture would not last long. During that same year, Zephaniah was kidnapped by the Patriot Rebellion, American insurgents who were attempting to annex Florida by force. The rebels attacked and raided towns and plantations, and all blacks they found and captured were sent back into slavery, regardless of their legal status. This put Anna at great risk. It was not long before the Patriots arrived to pillage Laurel Grove, taking 31 of its slaves in the process and using the plantation as their headquarters as they looted nearby areas. To avoid capture and being resold into slavery, Anna negotiated with the Spanish for her escape, bringing with her her children and 12 slaves. As she left the plantation, she burned Laurel Grove to the ground, along with her newly acquired homestead, so that the resurgents could no longer use them as a base. For this act of bravery and loyalty, the Spanish government awarded her 350 acres of land, 70 times what she had originally purchased earlier that year. In 1814, now reunited, Zephaniah and Anna moved to a plantation on Fort George Island, what is now known as Kingsley Plantation near Jacksonville, Florida. Prior to their purchase, the plantation was looted and vandalized during the rebellion, and every building aside from the main house was destroyed. Here on Kingsley Plantation is where Zephaniah took his other three wives, all slaves, who eventually bore him a total of nine children. All of his wives would eventually gain freedom. To say that the Kingsley's family dynamic was complex would be a massive understatement. But to put it simply, Anna was the one in his will named as his wife. These other women were considered co-wives of Anna, but not quite matching up to her in terms of importance or power. In fact, when the plantation had visitors, Anna would sit at the head of the table with Zephaniah. His wives and children lived in luxury and were educated with the best schooling that he could afford. In the 1820s, the Kingsleys built a separate kitchen connected to the main house by a walkway. In the space above this kitchen was where Anna resided with her children, and this building was eventually dubbed the Ma'am Anna House. A total of 32 slave residences were built not far from the main house. 
They were arranged in a peculiar semicircle pattern that was not found in any other plantations. Some historians believe that Zephaniah did this in order to keep a closer watch on his slaves. But others believe it was Anna's doing, as many African villages were arranged in similar patterns. In 1824, Anna finally bore her fourth and final son, John. During this time, Spain ceded Florida to the United States. This transfer of power led to significant changes in how slaves and free blacks were treated. Interracial marriages were considered to be invalid and the children of mixed descent were not allowed to inherit property. While all those born free slaves prior to 1821 were not subject to these new laws, their youngest son, born in 1824, was and would not receive the same protections as the rest of his family. Worried his family's rights may be taken away, in 1835, Zephaniah moved to Haiti, in a location that is now part of the Dominican Republic. He transferred all of his holdings to his three eldest children who stayed behind, while Anna and her youngest son, John, followed Zephaniah to Haiti in 1838. In total, Anna and Zephaniah brought 60 slaves, family members, and freed employees with them to Haiti. Since slavery was illegal in Haiti, those who were not yet free acted as indentured servants, who would earn their freedom in nine years' time. Anna and Zephaniah lived together on the island rather peacefully until 1843, when on a trip to New York, Zephaniah died at the age of 77. Because of the new laws in Florida, none of his children were able to inherit his property, and his sister, Martha, and her children challenged his will, claiming it was, quote, defective and invalid. Under Florida's new laws, it was illegal for black people to own any property, and Martha claimed that when they moved to Haiti to remain free, they also abandoned their right to their property in Florida. Despite the racial tensions boiling in Duval County, Being the powerhouse of a woman that she was, Anna returned to Florida in 1846 to participate in a legal battle for the property that was rightfully hers. Miraculously, the court upheld the treatise between the United States and Spain that decreed that all free blacks born before 1821 had a right to the same privileges they had under Spanish rule. This was an extraordinary achievement, especially for a black woman before the Civil War, when racial tensions were at their height. When the Civil War did break out not long after, Anna and her children were naturally Union sympathizers. Jacksonville was captured by Union forces in 1862, and Anna and her children were briefly evacuated to New York. Anna returned briefly to Haiti before moving to Florida, taking up residence in Arlington, to be nearer to her daughters, who were now married to white planters. Anna eventually passed away in 1870 at the age of 77, after living a full and eventful life. Anna's ghost can still be seen on Kingsley Plantation and is known as the Woman in White. She is usually spotted on the back porch of the main house and can often be photographed there. However, she is not alone. Her husband, Zephaniah, can also be seen on the plantation along with other malevolent spirits. Anna's descendants remain part of the African-American upper class for more than a century. One of her descendants even includes Florida's first black millionaire, Abraham Lincoln Lewis. And although Anna is long dead, her spirit and her legacy will live on for generations to come. A few parts of Anna's story are disputed, but it was widely factual. Anna did not appear to burn down her property to save it from insurgents, as she was actually on a gunboat away from the area at the time. Additionally, it's not confirmed if she ever truly was a princess, as her lineage is widely debated, and it is unknown whether or not she was royalty or was simply descended from royalty. She does share part of her name, Indaye, with a mythological ruling figure from Jolof culture. Additionally, her mother also held royal blood from Wolof culture. It is unknown whether or not Anna was the daughter of ruling royalty at the time of her birth, or if she just simply has royal blood in her. Unfortunately, there is no proof one way or the other, but the idea of her being a princess, then being sold into slavery, and then overcoming that slavery is a very powerful storytelling tool. Whether or not it's true, 
I'm not sure, but she surely is a princess in my eyes. Now, I was actually able to find a couple of primary sources about Anna, which was surprising given that she was a black woman in the early 1800s. However, the material I did find doesn't really help us tell her story as they mainly pertain to her will and her death. I was also very devastated that I couldn't find a photograph or a portrait of Anna. Now, websites that do claim to have pictures of her are not of her when you reverse image search them as I did. I posted one to Instagram that was said to be her. I found out that it wasn't. It was instead of famous black scientist. I apologize. And the woman on the episode image, if you're on Spotify or if you follow the Instagram, is not of her, but is of one of the freed slaves of Kingsley Plantation. While we don't have photographs or paintings of Anna, we do have descriptions. One of them from Zephaniah says that she was, quote, a fine, tall figure, black as jet, but very handsome. She was very capable and could carry on all the affairs of the plantation in my absence as well as I could myself. She was affectionate and faithful, and I could trust her. And in his will, he also says, She has always been respected as my wife, and as such I acknowledge her. Nor do I think that her truth, honor, integrity, moral conduct, or good sense will lose in comparison with anyone. So Zephaniah clearly held Anna in high, high regard. There's also a description from her niece, who I believe was one of Martha's children, the evil woman who tried to take all the property from Anna. Her niece described her a little bit differently, though she still held her in high regard and thought of her as beautiful. She described her as thus. I remember her very distinctly. She was not black, and she had the most beautiful features you ever saw. She was a most imposing and very handsome woman. Her smooth, light brown skin, her dark eyes made her outstanding, and I would not keep my eyes away for admiration. She was quiet and moved with regal dignity. I have never seen anything like her, before or since. Her daughter was there also, and she was very light in color, but not as good-looking as her mother. I was six or seven years old at the time. I was Kingsley's niece. The next morning, my aunt, Mrs. Gibbs, sent two servants for us with a horse and buggy, and we were carried over to Newcastle. My mother was furious that we had spent the night at Ma'am Anna's, but it could not be helped. So it sounds like even then, Martha had disdain for Anna. And I thought it was really nice that Anna let her stay in her home above the kitchen. I thought that was really cute. And I think this kind of just shows the character of Martha, just kind of this rotten old hag. That's how I like to imagine her, just like a total 1800s Karen. But I digress. So no letters, photographs, or personal effects of Anna's are known to exist, which is unfortunate. Even her grave is unmarked. It's sad, but as we've discussed in previous episodes, that is totally not out of the ordinary for a woman, especially one who was a slave and a woman of color. As I mentioned, Anna's ghost is often seen on the property and captured in photographs. Perhaps these are the only photographs of Anna Kingsley to exist. However, it should be noted that she's only spotted in the main house, where she never lived. And as we just discussed, she had her special residence, known as Ma'am Anna's house but she's not spotted there, which I find rather curious. Anna also didn't die on the property, and she hadn't lived there for nearly 30 years when she did. Now, some might say that she has returned there because she had fond memories and fond times, which may be true. But an account from one of her white friends, Susan LaAngle, says that she seemed quite lonely, but her work on the plantation and her jobs running the house kept her busy enough, which doesn't really convince me that she really loved Kingsley Plantation. If I were her, I would probably be haunting the homestead that was the first land that I was able to buy and run and make money from on my own that was burned down. I think that would be a great place to haunt, but I'm not going to judge the princess's decisions on where her spirit roams. So that's really it on Anna, but we have a lot more ghosts to talk about. So there are a lot of fun sightings on the Kingsley Plantation, which was eventually turned into a state park in 1955 and then later into a national one. This designation has allowed the property to be maintained and to welcome many visitors to the site who were able to witness strange things. So there is another presence on Kingsley Plantation that isn't the powerful, benevolent, inspiring woman that Anna Kingsley was. Instead, this entity is a dark, malevolent spirit that seeks to do harm, and its name is Old Red Eyes. 
Legend has it that Old Red Eyes was once a slave on Kingsley Plantation. This man went around Fort George Island and raped and murdered girls, both the daughters of white planters and his fellow slaves. Once the other slaves on the island discovered who was behind these brutal attacks, they banded together and lynched Old Red Eyes from an oak tree. Now, Old Red Eyes lurks on the property, spying on visitors from the trees, looking for his next victim. Some say that if you say his name three times, he may just appear. Old Red Eyes often manifests, as his name suggests, as a pair of red glowing eyes from the darkness of the woods, and was first spotted in 1978. After recounting the tale of a local in 1993, he has been spotted much more regularly. For me, the interesting thing about this story is that it is incredibly full of stereotypes and idiosyncrasies. The most blatant of them being the trope that black men are portrayed as violent murderers and rapists. And it's one that still, unfortunately, pervades today. And these types of stories and stereotypes, whether they were true in a certain instance or not, were often used to spread fear and rationalize the lynching of blacks in the South. It should be noted that during the plantation era, when this story of Old Red Eyes was said to have taken place, lynching was not common and was mainly seen during the Jim Crow era after the Civil War. Now, that doesn't mean that this story isn't true or it didn't happen. It just makes it highly unlikely as this wasn't a common practice among slaves or white people at the time. Also, interestingly, the take on the Bloody Mary myth of chanting his name three times to summon him coincides with the 1992 film Candyman, a film where the son of a former slave and a lynching victim is conjured in a similar fashion. Also curious is that in 1993, the sightings of old red eyes in this myth really ramped up, which kind of coincides with the film Candyman. Now, I haven't actually seen it. I am just... um, kind of reiterating some other things that I've read. So perhaps that's not the plot of the movie at all, and I'm being hoodwinked. Who knows? And lastly, on Old Red Eyes, Old Red Eyes was also a colloquial name for the devil in some parts of the South. I really like this myth. It's scary and spooky, and there's this kind of like tale of justice behind it. But Emily Palmer, one of the park rangers at Kingsley Plantation, has a more natural explanation for Old Red Eyes. She says, Interestingly enough, along Palmetto Avenue, we do have something hanging from trees that would reflect bright red eyes if a brake light was shining on them. They're called possums, and I believe that people have probably seen something of the sort, but I think it may have been a more natural explanation than what people are looking for. So that's a little disappointing, but in addition to these natural inhabitants like the possum, ghostly animals are also seen on the plantation grounds. At night, you can hear the screams of a young girl, and if you follow the sound, you may be presented with a jarring sight, a ghostly white peacock. Is it an omen? Early Christian lore suggests that peacocks represent Christ's resurrection and the soul's ability to live on after death. So could this be the soul of a young slave girl? Again, Palmer is a total buzzkill on this one as well, and she is quoted as saying, If you're unfamiliar with the fact that there are albino peacocks, and if you're not familiar with the sound that a peacock makes when it's doing its mating call, you might take that for a little girl screaming. It's a pretty unique noise. Okay, fine, Emily, but do you have an explanation for the ghost alligator that sits at the bottom of the stairwell? Huh? 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 Nah, didn't think so. Emily is always such a downer. Really fun at parties. A quick rundown of some of the other ghostly encounters on Kingsley Plantation include the smell of gingerbread in Anna's kitchen, furniture that moves on its own, a crying child in the well, the apparition of an African man in a turban, and old Zephaniah himself. There is an interesting tradition or superstition that the park rangers have that you must never say goodnight Zephaniah while locking up for the night because it causes, quote, bad things to happen. What this means? I don't know. What bad things? Is there some kind of precedent where someone said goodnight Zephaniah and then something tragic happened? I don't know. There's no evidence of it, but I I wouldn't chance it. However, it does seem rude on Zephaniah's part to be like, smiting people for saying goodnight. 
because you're just being nice and courteous. You're not being disrespectful. You're just like, good night, Zephaniah. Have fun on your plantation. But to be fair, in life, he was a polygamist (laughs) slave owner who had to buy his wives. So maybe he's not as rational as I would like to think. Regardless, Kingsley Plantation remains one of the most haunted places in Florida. And whether or not its ghosts are real or simply really spooky wildlife, the land is an important part of a free Black woman's story and her family's continuing legacy. I'm honored to have been able to tell this story to you, and I hope you also enjoyed listening. So you can find historic documents and photographs relating to the story and the Kingsley Plantation on the podcast Instagram at Crimes and Witch Demeanors, and as usual, sources are available in the show notes below. And that's really all I have this week. I really do hope you enjoyed the story of Anna Kingsley. I am sorry for also any mispronunciations um, because as you might be able to tell, I am a gringo and I do not know many languages, specifically West African. But I digress. So please, beware of possums hanging in the trees. Watch out for ghostly crocodiles at the bottom of your stairs. And as always... Stay curious and stay spooky. Bye.